Well, hey there, everyone. I'm Daniel Hahn, and I'm the online campus pastor here at Oxford Assembly of God Church, and this is our podcast. And I just want to thank you for listening today. We hope the message you're about to hear inspires you, builds your faith, and helps you see that God has a purpose for your life. And now, let's get into the message. But how many knows that sometimes it seems like the world is falling down around our ears? Every we look, there's turmoil and battles raging. I love that story about the wind blowing off the yes. mines. Yeah. Yet the Bible teaches us that we live by faith, not by sight. Amen. See, faith and fear cannot stay together. If you have faith... Fear leaves. But if we allow fear to take over, our faith diminishes. Jesus, during his short tenure on this earth, made many profound statements. Some very encouraging words. But probably one of his most profound statements is found in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, Thomas had made a statement. In John chapter 14, beginning with verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man or no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do not know him, and, and you have seen him. Then Philip made this statement. He said, Lord, show us the father, and it's enough for us. Then Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Did you catch that? Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. Because I am going to the Father. What have you asked in my name? This I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Did you catch that statement that you'll have even greater works? Greater works or greater things. Now, I've looked at that verse from several different angles. I've looked at it from several different Translations of the Bible. I even turned it over and looked at the bottom and there was no expiration date. There was not even a date that says best used by. And it was spoken by Jesus Christ. Who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Even greater things. Now, there are many people today that say the Bible is not relevant for us today. Some say the church is dead. Others say the days of miracles are over. But let me just ask you this question. Who has the better track record of being honest? Look what it says in Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness and hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, 
promised before the ages began. So we serve a God who never lies. So had you rather believe him or would you rather believe what it says in John chapter 8 verse 44 where it says, you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. Now, this is speaking of the devil. He speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. We live in some difficult times. And I know what I'm about to tell you might shock some of you. But I believe we need to plan for greater things. Plan for greater things. This is not the time for the church to huddle in fear. But it's the time for preparing for greater things. Now, I know I said this recently, but I like it, and I'm going to say it again. There are many in the world looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. Now, the question is, how do you plan for greater things? That's a good question. How do I plan for greater things? Now, let me go ahead and, and say this disclaimer because probably in a few minutes, I'll probably say better things. We're not really talking about better things. We're talking about greater things. Greater things. So how do you plan for greater things? Well, go with me to the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 1. Joshua, chapter 1, verse 1. Now, I want to remind all of you, you got an extra hour sleep, so that means I get to preach twice as long. Now, bear with me. Bear with me. If, you, if you'll listen fast, I'll preach fast, and we'll still beat most of the Baptists to lunch. <laughs> Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. I, I love that. I could spend a time on that because of all of the testimonies, all of the phrases they could have used about Moses, that great, great man. He said, the servant of the Lord. He said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, rise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised Moses." From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the low law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you may go. What a challenge. How would you like to replace Moses? I mean, Joshua had been his aide, his assistant for 40 years. And now all of a sudden, it's handed off to him. And I believe God was saying, listen, there's some greater things. Let's prepare for some greater things. So how did Joshua prepare for greater things? Well, let's go to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. Let's begin with verse 4. I know the first part of it. It says, 
Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, speaking of the ark, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way that you shall go. Oh, you say, well, why did you read that? How close are you supposed to follow? He wanted you to know. He wanted us to know if we're going to do and have greater things, we've got to stay in contact with God. Amen. We've got to stay in position and follow the leading of the Spirit. Now, I know it says, wait a minute, he's talking about the ark. The ark represented the presence of God. The Spirit is the presence of God. And if we're going to do anything in preparation of greater things, we're going to have to realize we've got to keep following the Spirit of God. In order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. America's facing some trying times. How it survives will not be dependent on who's president. That's right. That's right. It will be dependent upon the fact if it's following the Spirit of God or not. Amen. America has not passed this way before. Veterans, thank you again. But there's some challenges. And I believe that if my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then guess what? They can have greater things. Greater things. See, God had told Joshua he was going to have some greater things than Moses. You said, wait, wait a minute. Moses had it really good. Yes, he did. This was probably just as hard for Joshua to accept as it was for the disciples to accept when Jesus said, you shall do greater things. How are they going to do greater things? You've not passed this way before. Church, we've not passed this way before. Christian, you have not passed this way before. But I believe God is telling us the same thing he told Joshua. The same thing that Jesus told the disciples. You'll have greater things. Greater things. See, Joshua had learned for 40 years as they feasted on the manna in the wilderness. That was pretty neat. But he realized that they lived in one place at one time and they did not own any property. They had no security. They were basically still a bunch of people with no connections because they were wandering around in the wilderness. And here all of a sudden God was saying, you're going to do greater things. Joshua had found out a great truth. You can't live on yesterday's manna. You can't live on yesterday's manna. Greater things. So let's read on. So in verse 5, then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I think it's another way to say it. He's going to do some greater things. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. The Lord said to Joshua, well, today I will begin to exalt you or to do greater things in the sight of all Israel that they may know that I, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Now that's an interesting word. He says, I want you to Consecrate. 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 What, what in the world does that mean? See, that word is used in several forms throughout the Bible. And many times it's said to be holy. Be holy for what? I am holy. So to clean yourself up. To prepare for greatness. To get ready because even greater things am I going to do. Now, it doesn't take a great Bible scholar to know 
that in the very near future, they were going to do greater things. See, Moses never had land, but then all of a sudden, Joshua got to divide it. Greater things. But how many knows that because they quit following the Spirit, they quit following the ark, it went downhill fast. But if you go over a number of years to a guy by the name of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, and this story is recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, when Hezekiah became king, he began to clean up the temple. Now, what's another word for cleaning up the temple? He was consecrating the temple. And he said this, hear me, Levites. Now, who were the Levites? Those were the church people. They were the church leaders. Now, consecrate yourself and consecrate the house of the Lord, the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what is evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and have turned away from their faces from the habitation of the Lord. And they've turned their backs. He said, get rid of the filth. Oh, we love the promise of Chronicles that says, if my people. But we begin to forget humble themselves. And turn from their wicked ways. What does that mean? They got to consecrate themselves. Now, note that Joshua was able to do basically the same miracle that Moses did. What does the first miracle they did? They crossed the river. They crossed the river. How did God Authenticate Elijah or Elisha. He did the same miracle for Elisha. Now, the question is, how do we become holy? How do we become holy? I think we have a a key here if we go back to Joshua chapter 3 verse 9. And Joshua said to the people of Israel... Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. That's a good start. Listen to God. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Parasites, the Gigasites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. All those people. He said, you're going to drive them out. Now, for the 40 years that Moses had reigned, they had not driven out anybody. They had passed through their land. So, I have to come to the conclusion that Joshua was getting ready to do what? Greater things. Greater things. Church, I thank God for Oxford Assembly of God. I thank God for the Assemblies of God. God has blessed us in so, so many ways. Now, there are a lot of other great churches. I don't want to indicate that we're the only great one. But I thank God for our rich heritage. I thank God for our blessings that God has given us. But I tend to believe that God is wanting to prepare us for greater things. Greater things. Because we're going to keep our focus upon God. And look to Him as our strength. He said, notice what it says as we read on. It says... Now, therefore, or excuse me, behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. In other words, the ark, what did it represent? The Spirit of God. We've got to follow the Holy Spirit. We've got to do that. They needed the ark. And if we're going to do the work that God wants us to do, we need the presence of God. And the having the presence of God begins with submission to him. Submission to him. Hezekiah was sanctifying the temple. Using Oxford English, he was getting the garbage out. 
taking out the garbage, cleaning up the temple because they wanted to allow the Holy Spirit to have a place in there. And they had to do that. And before we can get the garbage out of our lives, friends, we've got to surrender. Now, I thank God for my heritage. I've already told you that. But I grew up in a church that had to get saved every week. We had to get saved every week. Because a lot of people begin in the spirit and we get into the flesh. Now, I'm not slamming our background. I'm just telling you that the spirit has to clean us up. Because we cannot clean ourselves up. We can start carrying out the garbage. That's a good start. We can do what we can do. But how many knows we need the presence of God? Now, Jesus used an illustration of light, but he also used the illustration of salt. And he says, if the salt has lost its savor, or if the salt has lost its, what, saltiness, it's not good for anything except to throw out. You can just put it on your driveways and your roads. Now, we don't need that in Florida, thank God. But that's all it's good for. But I did a little bit of research, and I was surprised, Gator, when I found out that you cannot make salt not salty. How in the world does it lose its savor when you mix all the garbage with it? When you mix sand and salt, it ceases to be salty. Have you ever tried to separate sand and salt? You're not going to get very far. It has to be a work of God. But how does it begin? It begins by submission or surrender to God. <coughs> so we've got to prepare for greater things. And as long as they followed the ark or the spirit, they had the power to do greater things. They were no longer slaves, but were free. Now, Jesus spoke to the disciples and told them, you will do greater things. And I realized that just totally true, what he was saying is that, listen, I'm here, can only be at one place at one time. I'm going to leave so the Holy Spirit can saturate you and fill you, and you can do greater things. And I understand that. But he was reminding them that they needed to be endued with power for what they needed to do. Because what did they need to do? Greater things. Church, if there's ever been a need to do greater things, it is today. Now, I'm going to upset a few of you when I'm about to say. Because I'm going to say, what do the greater things look like? And remember I said, I want to make sure I didn't use the word better. Because, see, some of the things that we look at, we think those are better. And it could be better for the human nature, but it may, it may not be the greater thing that God has in store for us. What about when Joshua did the greater thing, as soon as he committed, he got across the river, and what did he find? A walled city. A walled city. And God said, I want you're going to do greater things. The first thing that he faced was a city that seemed bigger than he was. See, often when we speak of greater things, we speak of things that satisfy self. My wife and I are looking forward to traveling. We want to take some more cruises. But those are just things they're not greater things see we discovered a long time ago and if you have discovered it you need to that the christian life is not a cruise ship it's a battleship 
The, cruise, the Christian life is not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. And if we never take another cruise, will I be disappointed? Yeah. But will I be devastated? Nope. Because that cruise is probably not a greater thing. See, Pentecost was going to bring the church into their earliest and greater things. How many believe he said, Terry, until you've been dude with power. So that you may be doing the work of the ministry. See, Joshua ran into a wall city. The church went immediately into persecution. I'm going to tell you, I don't think that's a better thing. But it caused them to do greater things. Greater things. See, almost immediately after Pentecost, a guy by the name of Saul, who changed the name to Paul, began to persecute the church. Some were arrested. The Bible says about Stephen, he was consenting unto his death. I take that to mean that he was the one that kind of initiated the whole thing. And God has said, you're going to do greater things. Greater things? And people getting killed? Maybe I need to remind you, and if you don't know it, you need to be told that every one of the Disciples died a martyr's death, except John. And they tried to kill John, but they failed. And so they exiled him to one of the Caribbean islands. No, that wasn't it. They exiled him to Patmos. Patmos. Now, we don't know a whole lot about that, but there was about an island 10 by 6 miles long that was described as desolate and barren. Today, they say it's got one tree. And in all likelihood, I was not able to find out what kind of mines they had on that island, but it was a place for prison labor. And it might have just been making big rocks, small rocks out of big rocks. But he lived there for 18 months. You say, but man, that wasn't greater. I think it was. Because if he hadn't have been on Patmos, we wouldn't have had the book of Revelations. Right. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. Due to time, I'm not going to read all these passages. But let me just read a few verses. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind that filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Drop down to verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose since the only third hour of the day. But this this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And it goes on to tell about those greater things they would do. Greater things. Greater things. Just added this early this morning when I was reminded that Paul and Barnabas, over in Acts chapter 13, they were ran out of Antioch. God was doing greater things, but how many knows when God began to do greater things, Satan likes to stir up something. And you know who he uses stir up? He uses people. And a bunch of people got disgruntled. And they run them out of town. But the last verse of that chapter said the disciples 
were filled not only with joy. I mean, not only the Holy Spirit, but with joy. How many thinks the church needs a dose of joy? Amen. Needs a dose of joy to know that God is wanting to do greater things. The day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost came, and a few days later, Peter and John headed to the temple. And a lame man was begging at the gate beautiful. And Peter said, told him, said, listen, I got tons of money. God's blessed me. I've got tons of money. No, he didn't do that, did he? He said, silver and gold. Have I none? But what I have, I give unto you. Greater, greater things. I hesitate to share this next thing with you. But it just keeps showing up on Facebook, keeps showing up everywhere I look. Because, see, some people think, well, Pastor, you don't understand. You're isolated from reality. You don't have to go through the things that some of us have to go through. This is pre-COVID stats. And I can tell you, COVID, according to everything I've read, is the hardest thing pastors ever had to go through. These were pre-COVID. I'm not going to read them all. But each month, 1,500 pastors leave the ministry due to moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention in the church. 80% of seminary and Bible school graduates who enter the ministry will leave it within the first five years. 50% are so discouraged they would leave the ministry if they could, could have but no other way to make a living. Seventy percent of pastors do not have a close friend, confidant, or mentor. And fifty percent of pastors' marriages end in divorce. You say, that's not greater things. No, that's what happens when we take our eyes off the one that gives us greater things. We must prepare for greater things. If we focus on circumstances or situations, we're not preparing for greater things. If we're like Joshua, we must see the wall not as a barrier, but stepping stone. We've got to realize we don't see our limitations, but prepare for greater things. Now, here's a key. We've got to focus and cease or focus on ceasing to be doing, but to start being being. See, we get caught up in doing and sometimes we forget about being. We need to remember that methods change, but the message never does. Styles move on, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. I woke up in the middle of the night recently remembering something that I memorized close to 60 years ago. I'm surprised because Wednesday night was a great sermon, but I don't remember what it was. It was good, wasn't it, Bill? Yeah. It was good. You say, what did you wake up to? I woke up and thought to this, I believe in the future of farming. With a faith, born not of words, but of deeds. Achievements won by the generation of farmers through better days, through better ways. Now, Lou, I couldn't figure out what in the world is that. But I, I got hung up on that better ways and better days and through the word faith. Faith. 
That's how we prepare for greater things. Believing God is still in control. Amen. Having the same faith that Joshua had. And I want to tell you, Joshua was scared. You say, why would you say that? Because he was human. How would you like to take over that congregation? With their huh? With their Whew. Bunch of miscontents. Yeah, that's the word. That's close. But he took them. Now, I'm not here to promote FFA. But I'm here to challenge us. To challenge me. To prepare for greater things. I believe the future for Oxford Assembly is greater than it's ever been. If you were seeing what we're seeing on Wednesdays with some of these kids, the hunger of these young kids is unbelievable. And I'm not talking about a hunger for the hot dogs, a hunger for the things of God. God's not finished with this generation. Now, if he gets finished, I'm well and good with it because we're going to go on to be with Jesus. But until then, I want to believe the Lord for greater things. Greater things. Brother Lee has done a marvelous job and is still doing a marvelous job leading our worship. Amen. But our future leaders with us this morning, and I know he's going to do greater things. Lee and I have already talked about this. We're not wanting to stay the same. We want to see greater things for God. To go to the next level. And I want to tell you something. I know somebody said, Pastor, you said something about transitioning out. I am. I'm going to be transitioning out. We don't have a timetable. But I'm telling you what. The next pastor is going to be a lot better. Don't you say anything about that one. I was expecting a great big amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what's the key? We've got to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. To quit going to church and start being the church. Quit wanting to do it our way and do it his way. And last but not least, we must be dependent on his spirit. Lee and worship team, come on up. We're going to sing an old chorus as we begin to close this service. It says, more of your glory, more of your power, more of your spirit in me. That's what we need. That's what we need. And we're believing God to do that because I'm going to tell you what, there's greater things ahead. You say, well, what if the rapture takes place? Isn't that a greater thing? Greater thing ahead. God's preparing us. Stand to your feet and let's worship the Lord together as He leads us in this old course. On behalf of our pastor and staff here at OAG, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being a part of our ministry. We are grateful for you and the support you give our church and its ministries so that we can continue to do what God has called us to do, to be the family church for the family of God. For more content from Pastor Strickland and Oxford Assembly of God, check out our media website at oag.church/media.